Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the latest episode of If Data Could Talk. I'm your host, Andy Cotgreave, and let's get straight into it. This week, I am being joined by somebody I truly admire. It's Ed Conway, the economics editor at Sky News. Now, Ed is one of the greatest data storytelling journalists operating in the UK at the moment. During last year's election, he was the data storyteller bringing the election data to life. And he and his team even brought a bee swarm chart to life on screens in front of millions of people. If you don't know what a bee swarm chart is, it's a really complicated chart. And that's why he's doing a good job, because he took a complicated chart and made it simple. And what is our goal if we're not doing that? Uh, and now during the pandemic, uh, Ed's been leading sort of the day storytelling on Sky News. And he's just launched a new podcast, The World Tomorrow. So, Ed, it's all sounding good. How are you doing today? I'm very well. How are you? Very well, indeed. Well, thank you for joining us on this fine day. So we want to talk a little bit about you, about COVID, about data storytelling on TV and other topics like that. So uh, first of all, for those that don't know you, tell us a bit about yourself and particularly how come you ended up being, how come the economics editor ended up being the data, data storyteller at Sky? Well, I think that's a, so that, that last thing first. It's funny um you know a lot of the time i think there is quite a lot of crossover um because those of us who cover economics spend a lot of our time buried in spreadsheet sheets and trying to particularly in economics journalism you're trying to explain something that seems complex and to some extent people are intimidated by it but it's very important and actually there's very real human stories through it and in, in a sense a lot of what we all try and do with data is the same you know you're taking this unwieldy data sets uh, people probably suspect it contains insights but a lot of people are intimidated by it and you're trying to tease out some insights and tell a story through it and i think you know actually that's quite a universal thing for, for for many of us dealing with data and so i think inevitably a lot of people who who end up doing economics tend to find themselves veering towards data visualization because it's just for me it's probably the best way of explaining so many of the, yeah. the things that i deal with and you know on, on a daily basis but as for how i ended up doing economics that's that's more <laughs> more kind of mysterious and uh, i'm less capable of explaining it really because you know back at university so i did english at university uh the first time i went, I went back to university again i'm afraid but i i, I did english the first time around and uh, I came out of it thinking, God, I, whatever I do, I don't want to do anything associated with like finance or anything like that. And uh, certainly I would have had no inkling that, that numbers were going to be a big part of it. I mean, actually, my, my, my late father was um, a doctor, but also t taught statistics. He was in anaesthetics. And so perhaps that I, who knows, maybe there was something <laughs> in the DNA that said you're capable of dealing with numbers. But when I started doing economics, you know, I, because I didn't have that grounding, I found I, I had to teach myself a lot of it. And in a way that was quite a good discipline uh, because, you know, when you're coming in from the outside and genuinely teaching yourself, and I kind of went and literally had textbooks and taught myself over the course of the kind of following years. Um, when you're starting from the outside and kind of reverse engineering a topic and then talking to, you know, experts and, you know, making sure that you're on the right track, a lot of data set storytelling, I think, is a kind of reverse engineering. You're going into uh, a data set, trying to understand how some people are finding one thing from it. And then in that exploration, sometimes you find out your own insights. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I guess that experience of having to kind of teach myself, econo I should say, so I went on and did a master's later on at, at Harvard, of all places. And the, I actually found that a, a less a less straightforward way of learning economics than kind of learning on the job. Maybe it just felt so abstractualized. But anyway, that's uh -huh. another story. But going in there, having to teach yourself something means that, you know, on the one hand, you don't really accept other people's explanations until you've, you've tried to reverse engineer them yourself, which is can be quite a good discipline. Yeah. Um, and on the other hand, it does take longer because, you you know, I, whenever I there's new data out, I will have to go to the spreadsheet and spend a bit of time fiddling around there rather than just accepting at face value what you know this economist or that analyst is saying about it just because i yeah. won't understand it myself but i yeah. think that and you'll you'll kind of appreciate this as, as, as well Andy. when when you understand it and when you have traveled that journey about about why this data means that thing then you just you're just so much better at explaining it and i there's no 
there's no kind of substitution for actually spending time with the data for a while absolutely. before you explain it to anyone. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 it's a great sort of, uh, what would they say, Genesis story. Is that what they say in Marvel superhero world? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the English background uh, and the self-teaching is is such a common thread between of people I see in this field. Oh, I, I, I had a job. Yeah, I had a geography background prior to that. I wanted to do an art foundation course. Um, and it's, you know, I think you're another reflection of the fact that to work with data, but be a communicator, you need communication skills, right? And you did English, which is about the best communication skills you could possibly have learned, right? Uh, so I think that's, that's, that's a really key thing that people uh, should always realize. Um, data science yeah. and data analytics is not just about science, right? Yeah, um, right. What, what was the degree at Harvard? Why, why was that one more abstract? So, well, no, so that was, it was actually a master's in political administration or something along like public administration. Wow. I should really know, shouldn't I? I've got it. Um, <laughs> But, so a large part of that, and you can kind of choose the the, the things that you want to focus on. And so having, you know, it's funny, economics, there is a lot of intellectual snobbery, I'm afraid, in it, in the same way that there is in law and in science and many other fields. And so I always felt, and maybe this is a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing, I always felt that not having an economics degree meant that I wasn't, you know, listened to, respected as much by the, the greats and the great and the good. Yeah. I don't know if that was right or wrong, but at the time I thought I felt that. And so I yeah. went off and I kind of did a degree that that was, you know, largely focused around economics to see if I if I could get it. And yeah. it's it, like I say, a lot of economics teaching, and this is still the case today, doesn't necessarily bear all that much resemblance to what's going on in the real world. It's very much about mathematical models. You know, there's 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 pros to that, but there are also some cons that we're all yeah. pretty yeah. kind of clear about now because you know we've lived through this this astonishing period. I mean, right now we are yes. living through an astonishing. Yeah astonishing period and there are lessons for all of us in that and seeing the world through an economic prism that's something you can learn to do and this is the same with data seeing the world through the, those prisms it's something you can learn to do just as you consume news as you consume analysis yeah, and indeed. papers you all it takes is to just try to put yourself in the position of having a questioning attitude towards the primary material um, yeah. and trying to tease different narratives out of it. It's not it's not rocket science in the slightest, as, as, as you know, but um, again, there is no substitution for just trying to just not trying not to bluff your way through it and trying to, to understand it as well as so, you can. So to, I, so um, so that so you became the economics editor, editor at Sky. And at some point, there must have been a moment where you're like, right, team, I'm going to show some charts. And I believe I know what I'm going to do, right? Uh, and well, which must have been quite a moment. I know the first time I did something like that is like, all right, I'm going to do it. Uh, tell me, t tell me about what you've learned or that that journey from you know maybe the first few times you did it and how it's different now. Uh, yeah, you know, some of the it's tricks you've learned, and then say... maybe some of the techniques you use today to yeah. get this to the screen. Because I can't, I can't actually remember the first time that I try to show a chart but that's a, maybe that's because I've been a sky for so long it's getting on for a decade now but <laughs> definitely there was a point where so initially in my first few years um we we started to try when you have the budget every year every spring and then you had the kind of autumn statement these big moments where all of the all of the UK finances were kind of laid out there and I always thought they could we could kind of show it a bit better because there's so many numbers and no one else seem to explain it very well and so we built this big screen at sky we used to have this studio that had this enormous kind yeah. of screen you know i don't know how many you know stories high and we would project uh, it was a whole data bank of stuff onto it and for the first time normally when tv graphics are done it can be a relatively linear process you know so um, it's a slideshow basically and you know there's an auto cue that often is, is followed and then um, you'll say something and then you'll move on to the next slide. And that's, you know, I hope I'm not giving too much away, but that's kind of how a lot of TV graphics presentation mm -hmm. is done. But we decided we wanted to do it differently. And so we built, well, not me, the, the, the amazing tech team at Sky built this kind of console that allowed me to control the screen that was behind me and to pull out certain charts and say, well, look, there's GDP. I pressed the button, it was just on an iPad. And then the, the GDP chart came out. And in this, for these things, 
we didn't have auto cues. So in a way, so A, it was a little bit more scary for me, but B, it was really liberating because <laughs> it meant that provided I knew what I was going to be pointed at, pointing at, I could tell this story that was much more yeah. engaging. There's this real difference when you're actually kind of properly, and and really we just took and took it and run from there. Um, and since then, you mentioned you know B swarm graphics that we did in the elections. So it was the same thing. And in the election, we had a similar principle, which is that I was controlling some of the the graphics. I had a vague idea going in there about what I was going to show, but I controlled it all. And and then we had a steady cam that could kind of like zoom in um, and show what I was showing. And sometimes, you know, because it was very fluid, sometimes something would be breaking, you know, on the other side of the studio, and we would have to slightly change plan and I would say oh well hang on it's interesting because I've also got this and let me show you what's going yeah. on in this constituency um and sometimes I have to kind of like almost beckon the camera in which is because the camera didn't know where I was going to go next nor did the gallery and the people, the people directing it which I think they probably are constantly slightly terrified about um but but we just kind of took things from there and I think that what we do at Sky um, you know, I'm going to blow our own trumpet on this, I'm afraid. But what we do, I think, is quite different to a lot of other news channels in that in that um, we've taken away a lot of the structure when we're showing some of these data stories. Mm. And we try to go for the data first uh, approach. And I think, you know, touch wood, I think the viewers appreciate that. I think that yep. it's clear what we're explaining to them. And I certainly prefer doing it. And it means that I can knock together so that, you know, we have these big events like a budget or an election or something like that. But also on a day to day basis, I can knock something together. And a lot of the time, you know, again, don't want to give too much away, but I'm literally just making stuff in spreadsheets and putting them onto uh, onto PowerPoint or a few other things. Well, I can knock things together and put them on the screen like this. I'm in my study right now, but it could, yeah. it could as well be in the, the TV studio in the space of a few minutes. And that is just amazing for TV, you know, for live, for a yeah. live breaking TV audience. You know, the I, number comes out, we have it on screen, we can show you the analysis minutes later. I, you know, I did that just the other day, in fact, you know, about a day ago, Bank of England makes a big decision. It was at 12 o'clock. By 12.04, I was on air with a chart showing wow. the data. I mean, that was it was a slightly panicky moment for me, if I'm honest with you, <laughs> but 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 it happened. We made it happen. So, yeah, that's, that's exciting. And, you know, if you if you love data and I do, there couldn't be a more exciting kind of there's, platform to, to, to tell yeah. those stories. There's something really interesting there, because what you've just described, you know, many CEOs and execs would be like, well, hang on. Why can't my analysts do that? I'm paying a lot of money for this analytics program. And what you're describing isn't. <laughs> You've said it yourself. It's not rocket science. It's uh, yeah. you're an English graduate uh, who understands storytelling. She's got curiosity and knows where to go to get this stuff. And yeah, you don't. And you don't have. I mean, maybe you use complex data science tools as well. But actually, you know, you you use what's available, no, and you can still it's really, be. It's, it's good really simple. Yeah, yeah. I love. It's really simple. Yeah, the, the election night coverage you guys did, I, I thought was fantastic because w what I like about the way uh, your team works is. Uh, you're not afraid to do the complex charts, recognizing that complexity can be made simple with time and animation and explanation, right? I think that's the big mistake um, yeah. people make. Also, I get the sensation, I get the feeling that you and the team are having a great time as well. And I think the ability to do that, you, you know, you seem to just to be in the flow, right? You, you just, you, you know, at your fingertips, you have access to all your knowledge right and 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 i think that's yeah. extremely important to be a confident storyteller as well uh yeah i hope that's what comes across i hope that's uh how well, you're that's, feeling that's, that is reassuring that's the idea <laughs> anyway yeah <laughs> thank god um now i know another thing you've um as we sort of go tr transition from the tv presentation maybe to the covid uh 19 situation uh you, you know i think you you've reveled in trying to get behind the numbers Right. Instead of just going, here's what the Office of National Statistics said today. You're saying, well, OK, did they say that? And what does that actually mean? Uh, so can you talk to, a yeah. uh, talk to us a little bit about that? Um, yeah. Yeah. And, do, you, uh, well, do you want me to talk to that kind of COVID thing? Because it is I mean, it is definitely, you know, a lot of us, a lot of those of us who kind of deal with data visualization, mostly have spent most of our kind of professional lives looking at economic data. And then mm -hmm. suddenly 
this terrible crisis comes along and it's a public health crisis and um in relatively short order we kind of notice you know that, uh, that this is basically a data story as well as public i mean it's the two things it's epidemiology yeah. which is half data and half kind of health in a way so we and i say we just meaning like you know me and kind of fellow fellow uh, economics journalists for instance the ft um we we initially i think were quite hesitant about like leaping into this story but then realized i think that that we had certain tools that could tell that story relatively powerfully so you know i was on twitter early on in the early on in the crisis i was on twitter putting out a few charts and you'll have seen you know the ft has done them and new york times and our world and data those kind of exponential charts yeah. of cases and deaths and so on and i actually you know kind of was relatively early on was 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 making those charts on twitter but wasn't really pushing to put them on air uh, for sky because i did wonder initially whether the complexity of them you know because these are logarithmic charts they mm. they are much they are orders of magnitude more complex than stuff that you would normally put on tv yeah. you know even to to some extent more complicated than than b swarm charts and so we were hesitant for we thought for a while carefully about whether should we should be using them but then after a few weeks we did and 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 actually that's been one of the most powerful things throughout the crisis has been to to tell the story of those trajectories that different countries have been experiencing and also as as you say Andy to to try to ask questions about the data because none of these none of these data are, with, are without their problems i think especially when it comes to a lot of the the death numbers there's very yeah. different standards of of collection there's, there's some of this stuff is reliable some less so some includes stuff some doesn't and part, we we've we've tried i think as much as we can to make a merit of 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 that um but it you know it's been it's definitely been a roller coaster because yeah this this stuff is this stuff is you know these are the most depressing charts i've ever had to talk about and i've done plenty of kind of recession charts and unemployment charts and those are pretty depressing as well but what you have here is hundreds of thousands of people who you know who, whose lives and whose families have lost a loved one whose lives have been yeah. changed forever and that kind of weighs on you because um it is it is of such gravity so yeah this i mean like in a in a way it's been a a really important period for for data visualization i think it has it's, it, mm, it, to some absolutely. extent i think that the the kind of sector has has almost come of age and now data visualization is 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 even more mainstream i i um, think uh, yeah. I, I i one of the challenges we've had in the field for a, a, a decade or so is people say well come on show me you claim data visualization is has changed the world it's like well show me the proof and it's yeah. difficult to go you know these charts change the world but here we've got yeah. this data story we've got aggregations which people then question and talk about uncertainty it's like okay brilliant that that's that's the truth of data it's uncertain yeah and then you know how many more millions of people do at least understand what a logarithmic and an exponential curve is you know that that's that's incredible and they've learned about data collection about the biases in that yeah right? it's, it's it's a tragic situation yeah but hopefully it's a silver lining uh, well i think so yeah i think it's it's i mean like uh so, so actually, one, so one of the things that that I did, actually, I'll show you because this, so this, this is yep. this is a, a presentation, a chart that, a set of charts that I made recently, and it kind of goes to that point that that there's always, you know, we should always be relatively skeptical about um, these lines that we're shown by, for instance, the government, because the, yeah. that's the other thing is the government, or, or governments, I should say, around the, the world are are doing the same thing. They're using their same tools. But it's part of the job of journalists and indeed, you know, the, the general public to, to be, you know, to, to, to perhaps have some skepticism uh, mm -hmm. and to check whether all of this stuff is can be relied on. Yeah. And one of the Let's things. See. Oh, hang on. Let me go to the back of this. One of the things that um, that in the UK we um, was was a big point of focus was testing, like how many people were being tested, because initially our testing scheme didn't test that many people. Um, and then the health secretary introduced this target for 100,000 people to be tested. And very shortly after the target was introduced, suddenly they met it. And I put together this kind of presentation to show that underneath this line, there's lots of kind of various bits of data, various types of tests that aren't all equal. 
you know, yeah. they aren't all kind of equal. So for instance, so what I did was I kind of breaking down the line and showing what made up it. And so you've got some tests that were gold standard, those ones at the bottom, but then you had other tests, some of which, you know, there were question marks over because we didn't know how many people have actually been tested. You had other tests still, which were posted out to different people. So these are just tests posted, you know, in the post. We didn't know how many of them are actually being carried out. They all counted towards this 100,000 target. In fact, without those posted ones, the government wouldn't have, wouldn't have got to 100,000 apart from yeah. like one day. And then you had other, other pillars as well. And the point of this was just a short sequence to show that beneath this one single number that the government was fixating on, and I think throughout this, we around the world have had moments where the government has said, it's all about this number. But beneath that number, there was so much complexity and so many different layers of doubt. And yeah. The funny thing is, you know, when I did that, I did a relatively short sequence for our kind of evening news. But then I also did a slightly longer version of telling that story, um, which I think we put up on YouTube. And those longer versions, which which, you know, normally I'm told by by the kind of social media guys at Sky that you should be as short. You make them as short yeah. as possible because no one likes to watch. Anything. Yeah. But some of those longer ones, which ran into, you know, 10 minutes or so or even longer, we're getting hundreds of thousands, some, you know, millions, if you take all of them together, of views, because I think people do engage with in-depth analysis, um, provided it's kind of, it seems germane, provided it seems relevant to their lives, provided it's kind of explained relatively well, and provided you're telling a story. And the story in yes. this case was, listen, this 100,000 number the government's going on about, turns out that a lot of this stuff doesn't necessarily count for, you know, it's not all equal. So, yeah. um, it, and this is, I, I, that's one tiny example of what we've been trying to do throughout this. And the other thing that's interesting about this particular story and some of the other ones you've done, and I know you've talked about this before, is that, um, you know, I can tell a story by by starting small and then zooming out to see the big picture of all the data. Whereas what you're actually doing is kind of inverted. You go, well, here's the data point. Well done, Matt. Well done, Matt, Hanco Matt Hancock. You got the 100,000 yeah. tests. Yeah. They're going, well, should well, we zoom, you know, should we go in yeah. that data and look underneath it? Uh, yes. And, and you know, yeah. the, these are the storytelling techniques that are available to us all. Uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you start, you can, and, and I think both both are really, both can be absolutely fascinating. You start, you can start narrow and kind of zoom out. Um, yeah. And yeah, or you start big and go in. But definitely, provided there's, you know, context and you're transforming a number that either seems monolithic um, or kind of incomprehensible, you're transforming that into something that has depth and has texture mm -hmm. and has story elements, then you can take people with you. And if they come to the end of it and think, oh, I actually got that, then then you're you're winning. That's, that's yeah, and, it. And, and you can do that. And another, re and another win, which actually I've seen happen a lot on Twitter, and some people say it's a negative thing, but another win is if people get to the end of that and go, well, okay, Ed, but I disagree, that's actually a win too because you know you're, you're telling a version of a truth, right? And but yeah, that's just, it's a conversation starter. Um, yeah, you know, we can have that on social media, uh, not always in the best way, but it it is the conversations I think are really valuable outputs of this. Um, I think they so should be. I, yeah. I don't, and I don't, I, I do wonder sometimes. You know, it's difficult. I think it's I think social is social media kind of a good or a bad thing here. I mean, definitely in the world of data visualization, it's been kind of amazing in that you can you can share a lot of this stuff and make contact with different, you know, data visualizers uh, in a way that you just never could before. And I definitely have kind of met people over Twitter who who then you know I've had kind of important kind of uh, professional relationships with. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. It, it needs to be treated as a conversation rather yeah. than as a kind of, you know, you're coming out and broadcasting and because uh, all of this stuff, we should all be kind of humble about it, that none of this is definitive. No, um, absolutely. Ideally, let, my, my kind of thing, you know, epitaph, you know, ideally should be something along the lines of where there is, where there is certainty, let me sh sow doubt. Um, because doubts and, you know, uh, understanding that we don't know the answer to a lot of this stuff is I think where a lot of wisdom is and we're too tentative and too I think lacking in courage to do that these days yeah I think us you, in all fields. you wrote about that in the times recently didn't you and 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 kind of making the point of you know should 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 we have leaders who bluff their way even if they're not 
confident or equipped with the data or should they show humility even if they have the data with the uncertainty within the data uh you know they're kind of big big questions probably beyond the scope of getting to an answer here but at least it, it this crisis is is one where it's like okay leaders do, do you want to Tell us you're sure, or do you want to tell mm. us you're unsure? And, and are we, and you as a journalist, are we in a place to best let them have that space? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. And I think I think that this, what this crisis has done, and I think it's a powerful moment for humanity, is, is it's reminded us if we didn't already know about it, it's reminded us of the limitations of, of our understanding of the world, you know, whether it's science, whether it's economics, we're, we're in pretty uncharted territory with this mm -hmm. disease. We were in uncharted territory with the response to it. And I think that that we struggle with that because we're quite complacent about the extent to which we um, have control of our environment. And when I say environment, I mean, you know, the medical environment, scientific environment, yeah. the economic environment. There's, you know, this idea that we that we know what we're doing. But, you know, we've had crisis after crisis recently, the financial crisis, you had you could say there was a kind of certainly a, a liberal crisis uh, in the in Brexit and the election mm -hmm. of Donald Trump, where the establishment was certainly surprised by by what happened. And now you've had this, and I feel like you put all of that together. And what the message from all of that it should be is that is that there is there should be doubt about you know there should not be complacency about what we understand either about public opinion or about the world, and we should find a way of being able to express our doubt. And I just don't think we're very good at that. And I think the media has some part to play in that because I think a lot of the discourse that that, that mm. happens uh, in media doesn't help on that front. I think politicians aren't very good at it. I think, I think economists are very good at it. Um, and, you know, uh, the I think it's more courageous to be able to say you don't know when it comes yeah. to, to anything. But I so rarely ever encounter that. And I kind of, yeah. I, I've got a kind of like a, pe a pet theory. So, you know, I so I went to, I went to Oxford and at Oxford, they've got the tutorial system and the tutorial system is all, it's kind of, to some extent, it's an amazing way of teaching people. It's just, you know, a two, two students and then sometimes one student and then a tutor. And so it's this very kind of almost one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one version of teaching. But to some extent, if you can bluff your way through that, then you're a, you're a winner. Um, and if you can kind of like give the impression that you know the answers. Um, I see the same thing in in the States as well. I, I did this course uh, at Harvard at, um, at a business school and you get points for class participation, which again is a good thing. But I noticed pretty soon that it's 50 percent of your of your mark that people would chirp up with something that sounded very confident and quite plausible. Um, and I, to some extent, I feel they were getting marked on the basis of their confidence yeah. and plausibility rather than on the basis of the extent to which they were exploring an issue. So we're rewarding people. And I think we do reward people. It's people who are confident who kind of get the promotions. It's people who are confident who we elect. We don't, you know, we don't kind of champion doubt. Yeah. And I think that is helps explain, I think, why we're in the mess we're in today, dare I say. Uh, I I think that's a fantastic. That's probably about data visualization. It's a, a, well, I I think it is. But I I think it is there because, or I think data has a role to play in it because we can't also then use. Well, I've got data and therefore I'm I know the truth. It's like well, uh, right. understanding the data within the data and acknowledging to what extent you have to be driven by the data or by your hunch. You know, it. it I think it. I th I think that has a role to play too. I mean, I, they're big topics you just covered. <laughs> so I think. <laughs> Uh, that's the end of the main questioning section. Uh, so thank you very much for those. But we have a sec an, an extra segment in our show, Ed, uh, where we ask our guests what it is that they're reading, watching or listening to. So I, I've got something to share, but I think uh, this time, why don't you go first, Ed? Is there something our audience should check yeah. out? By the way, I mean, so so have you found? I mean, I I certainly did. I found in the early the early days of this crisis that I couldn't really read any fiction that felt like it was set in this world because it was just like such a dystopian time. I had to read. <laughs> I had, I read like um, what's he called? Cormac McCarthy, like stuff that felt like 
Yeah, not the road. Not the road. No, right. No, I would, don't know. But, but there's other things. I can't remember which one I read. But you need. Like, I, I do feel love like dystopian fiction. Really important. Yeah, I do love dystopian fiction, but I've not gone there since uh, March. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, exactly. Um, but uh, so I, you know, I, the stuff that I'm kind of attracted to, um, as you probably might have guessed, is kind of episodes where people take a conventional wisdom and try and turn it on its head. And uh-huh. and I think that's kind of what I, I try and do that a lot. And what there was just a blog I saw um, not long ago by a guy called Tom Forth, who's, um, I think he kind of works in Open Data Interactive in Leeds. And, uh, um, uh, and he was basically pointing to this fact that has been taken as gospel within newspapers and elsewhere that in the UK at least, and I wonder if it's probably the same in other countries, the areas that have faced the most deaths from COVID-19 have been areas that are the most deprived. And that was what various analyses have said from the Office for National Statistics, the IFS, and we saw it on the front page of the newspapers. I dare say I might have even mentioned it on Sky. But what he did was he looked at the data and said, hang on, what what you're showing with these charts, which show a clear kind of correlation, you know, the more the more deprived area, the more people are dying. These charts aren't measuring the number of people who have died. They're measuring what's called age standardized mortality rates. And an age standardized mortality rate basically kind of counts. If you die when you're younger, it counts for more. It's like more mm-hmm. of a death. So it's it's adjusting for, for that. And that makes sense with many diseases, although it's not clear as of yet. It might do, but it's not totally clear as of yet that that's something you should apply to, to COVID-19 in this situation we're going through. And so what he did was he went through the data and kind of did a regression and 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 just looked at actual number, of, you know, bare counts of people who had died in different areas. And what did he find? It's basically the same. It's a flat line. Huh. It's not a it's not a kind of you know distribution. And you know, it may or may not be uh, the right way of looking at this data. But what I like about it was that he was taking conventional wisdom. He was underlining that there are certain assumptions within this data set that are just at nowhere really properly explained. Right. Um, and that's the kind of analysis that that gets me excited because it's going back to the source data and not even accepting what even the Office for National Statistics would tell you, which in this case was the people who were providing that data. So yeah. really interesting. Oh, that's great. So that, that was from Tom Forth from Leeds, and we'll put the link to that uh, in below. Great. We'll have a medium you are watching this in. Uh, so the thing I've, I've enjoyed in the last week is the latest technology quarterly from The Economist. Uh, it's always a good read. Uh, and this week they're focusing, or recently they focused on artificial intelligence. Now I'm part of the industry. We we went, yeah, hey, AI, it's going to automate everything. And as the economists are pointing out, it's like, mm, yeah, you know what? You all overhyped it again. Uh, maybe those self-driving cars, the last 20% to get them to automation, it's like, no, we're not quite ready for that. Speech recognition, <laughs> it's really good, ah, but that last 20%, we can't do it. Uh, and yeah. so it's, it's it's really interesting thinking, well, how are businesses actually dealing dealing with slight disillusionment you know still great things that it can do but it isn't going to reply you know it isn't going to automate the things they did so i, I don't know if you yeah check that out it's, or... it's, 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 t- it's really fascinating and as a, as a kind of contrarian i i obviously i'm attracted to that point that it, it, well like kind of two two three years ago everyone was saying well ai is going to take over the world it's all about ai and always when i when everyone is saying something like that oh, i'm always kind of curmudgeonly saying oh no i don't know about that yeah um, so it's nice to see that borne out in an actual piece of analysis i mean i, I as, as someone you know, i have a tesla and i have i have the autopilot on it right i love it i absolutely love it but you know so so i have some experience and this is just an anecdote from you know kind of curmudgeon but i have some experience of it um but boy and I use it on the motorway all the time. And it's great when you've got two mm-hmm. lines, but you know, between you're driving between two lines. Um, but there is no way I would trust that to take me off the motorway or anywhere else. And no. uh, I don't, I'm, I, to be honest with you, I don't really even trust it with the whole overtaking thing. It's changing lane, which sometimes every, every so often it's like, do you want to change lane? I can change lane. And I'll be like, oh, I think I'd just rather do that myself. Yeah. It's yeah. all the same with you. <laughs> um, 
So oh, brilliant. Um, yeah. It doesn't. Yeah. I mean, I think I think that's a really interesting thing. And um, yeah, thank God that we humans still have a few things we can do. Yeah, I think I think that exactly. I think that's a good place to stop. The anecdote from a curmudgeon and a little bit of hope from a, <laughs> for the for humanity. Uh, great. All right. Well, um, we'll put links and resources to those uh, articles below and some of the other things Ad has talked about and some of his work that you can find on Sky News. So, Ad, uh, thanks very much for your time on this fine Friday. Uh, thank you. We'll, uh, hope to see you again soon. And thank you, everybody for tuning in to If They Could Talk. Again, check out the resources. Uh, tell us what you think on social media across all channels. And we have many more exciting episodes coming soon. So tune in next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.